In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today, with the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we will begin our study into the Epistle to the Hebrews. And before we start reading the Epistle and interpreting and explaining the contents of the Epistle, we would like to have a quick introduction and we, as we used to be uh, to do in the past, the introduction would cover certain points, mainly who is the writer, to whom it has been written, the time of writing the epistle, the purpose behind writing this epistle, and the main theme of the epistle. And if possible, we will have some key words that will help us to understand as we go along and read the main body of the epistle. If you have read before, and when we read it together, there is nowhere within that epistle mention of the writer of the epistle. So, the theologians and the historians had a lot of dispute at the very... Uh, uh, the early years of Christianity, to whom, uh, to uh, who has written this epistle about who has written this epistle. However, the consensus opinion and the conclusion came to the point that Saint Paul was the writer of this epistle, and this is the belief of our Orthodox Church. And after a lot of um, discussions and different opinions, majority of other churches nowadays have the same belief. But why we think that St. Paul is the writer of this epistle? As we know, he wrote 13 other epistles, and if this one is counted as his 14th, would have written more than half of the New Testament as we have it in between our hands. As you know, the New Testament contains 27 books, and now we have agreed that 14 out of the 27 is written by St. Paul. Why we think St. Paul is the writer? There are certain points, and if we look at them, that will reassure us and confirms our beliefs that St. Paul is the writer. Point number one, the style of writing. The way he writes. And if we read this epistle, though slightly different from the others, but there are certain sentences, there are certain phrases, and the way of talking that tell you that Paul is the writer of this epistle. I will give you a few examples to support what I am saying. And uh, one of the examples is the description or indication to the uh, spiritual words, the spiritual speech, uh, as the milk. And he has said exactly the same thing, very similarly. In, uh, towards the end of chapter 5 of this epistle, and I read to you from verse 12 to the end of this chapter, when he says here, For though by the time, by this time, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk, and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. And also, if we, if I take you through back to the first epistle to the Corinthians and chapter 3, we will notice the same expression is being used in the beginning of chapter 3. It says here, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to 
carnal as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. Here we are, as you noticed, the same expression or the same description of the word of God by milk for those who are at the very beginning of their spiritual life. Another example is the description of the word of God as the sword. And this description is very clear in chapter 4 here of this epistle. Uh, from verse 11 when it says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Same expression or a same description of the word of God as the sword is mentioned in chapter 6 of the epistle to the Ephesians when St. Paul was describing the spiritual war and talking to us about the armor of God and the, one of the pieces of the armor of God was the word of God and he described it there as the sword of the spirit and so on many other examples to show us, assure us that the style of writing in between this epistle and other epistles of St. Paul are very similar. The second point is the way Paul concludes his epistles. There is a certain way of greetings when he leaves his blessings to the people he's sending any epistle to, and he is always concluding his epistles by the word grace, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, grace of God. And if we take, if we go to the last chapter of this epistle, chapter 13, and the last verse, and we read it together, it says here, greet all those who rule over you, and all the saints, these from Italy, greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. St. Paul himself, when he wrote the second epistle to the Thessalonians, <clears throat> he indicated that this is his way of writing, or his way of sending his greetings or conclusions of any epistle he writes. And if we go together to uh, chapter 3, which is the last chapter of the second epistle to the Thessalonians, we will notice that when he uh, writes in the last, ver uh, last two verses, saying from verse 17 and 18, saying, The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So he's telling us here that the sign that he is the writer of any epistle he does is the way he concluded by the word the grace. Yet another important point is the mentioning of Timothy at the end of this epistle. And that is uh, written here at the last paragraph of chapter 13 of this epistle, uh, verse 22, when he says, And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words, Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. And we all know that Timothy was the main companion of St. Paul in most of his preaching trips. So even Timothy went to prison with, with St. Paul. So now he's talking about Timothy as the main companion or main disciple for him is another indication that this St. Paul is the writer of this epistle. Another point is shown in the second epistle of St. Peter. Towards the end of the uh, St. Peter's second epistle of St. Peter's, 
St. Peter here writes from verse 15 to, uh, to verse 16 saying, And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as do you do also the rest of the scriptures. So we notice here that St. Paul, St. Peter, sorry, is indicating to certain epistles written by St. Paul, and some of them is being sent to the group of peop people that Peter is writing to. And we know that Peter, when he wrote, he wrote the two epistles to the Jews. And the epistle to the Hebrews is written to the Jews. So most likely, and most, most historians or theologians know that when Peter is writing this part, he is talking about the epistle to the Hebrews, which is in between our hands at the moment. However, that will bring the question to our minds. Why Paul, when he wrote all his epistles before, clearly wrote his name and usually at the beginning of the epistle? And in this particular one, he had no mention of his name at all whatsoever. And if we think Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, his main preaching trips and his main writing and teachings were directed towards the Gentiles. This has resulted in the Jews looking at Paul unfavorably. So they used to hate him because all along history they used to think of themselves as superior to the Gentiles. So the Jews did not like Paul at all and if he wrote his name at the beginning of the epistle surely that would have put them off from reading the rest of the writing and by doing so he would have lost his target and the epistle wouldn't have achieved what he wanted to achieve from writing it. But that will take us to the point why Paul if he is the apostle that mainly concerned with preaching the Gentiles, decided to write to the Jews. Paul is a very loyal Jew, a Jew and he described himself that way. And he used to have a lot of love to his own people, despite the fact that they did not like him. And at the time of writing this epistle, the Jews who converted to Christianity were suffering a lot of persecution and pressures, and we could divide them into two camps or two groups. One group who are not true, well-founded Christians, and they were still hesitant, and they were about to return back to their old beliefs and reject Christianity. The other group uh, is the group who are true Christians, true converters, who has got very good faith but need the support and the encouragement. So that, that St. Paul felt from his or driven by his love to his own people, that he should write this epistle, which, as you will see, when we go along reading it and understanding it, the themes of this epistle is two things. Warning and encouragement. So now we understand why he wrote to the Jews and what is the purpose of writing this epistle. 
The subject of the epistle is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we consider this epistle is one of the strongest links between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, the two main books in the New Testament that ties between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Gospel according to St. Matthew and the Epistle to the Hebrews. When we read through the Epistle, we will understand a lot of the worshipping rituals that the Jews used to practice. Some of them with clear understanding and a lot of them without understanding the purpose of these rituals. Therefore, we will notice that the epistle is built around the idea of contrast or comparison. The contrast between the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the main figures of the Old Testament that they were highly considered by the Jews in the past. And the examples to that, the angels, Moses, Joshua, Aaron, Abram, Jacob, and so on. Many names we will come across. And if we would like to divide the epistle into parts, we can say it's mainly three parts. The first part is from chapter 1 to chapter 7, and mainly talking about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps with some contrast comparing him with other figures as I have just mentioned. The second part of the epistle is from chapter 8 to chapter 10, and it talks about the sacrifice, comparing the complete sacrifice that was offered once by the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he offered himself on the cross for our salvation with all the sacrifices that used to be offered up to the time of coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the third part of the epistle is probably as we would have normally noticed from St. Paul's writings is the practical part or the application of faith after he has made his interpretation previously. So from 11 to 13, he will have the practical application of the faith. That leaves us with the last point in the introduction, which is when this epistle was most likely written, date-wise. Most theologians agree that this epistle was written between the year 64 and 68, towards the end of St. Paul's life, before he uh, was beheaded uh, in, in, in Rome. Surely this epistle was written when the temple was still there, before its destruction uh, in the year 70, because all the Jewish worshipping rituals were still taking place and they are still practicing it. And you will understand that when we read through as he gives a lot of examples from offering sacrifices, the high priests and so on, and even mentioning the tabernacle which we will come across and we will understand all the symbolic indications of these things. Now, following this introduction, let us begin our journey through the Epistle to the Hebrews. And uh, we pray that God will give us the blessing of reading this wonderful Epistle. And we hopefully will learn a lot from it that will guide us and uh, help us to grow in our spiritual life. What we will do now is we will read from the first chapter and we'll try to stop in each section that needs interpretation and we will explain about it and its reference and so on. Before we begin, let us agree that the first chapter of this epistle is concerned with the Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Son of God. And that is to distinguish 
this from the second chapter which is concerned with Jesus Christ the Son of Man okay let us begin by reading the first four verse from the first chapter of this wonderful epistle God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they I would like to look at this paragraph or these four verse in, as in two sections. The first section is when he says God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And we'll stop there because following this he will continue to say whom he has appointed so and so etc and the following few verse which we will discuss in a minute are more concerned with the glory of the sun but before we enter into this part and further explain into it I would like to stop and contemplate a little bit on the first verse or verse and a half because what struck me there is two things. First, you could notice that this is the perhaps the only book in the Bible that starts with the word God. And the second point is when he says spoke. So God is speaking. God is always speaking. God is always approaching and trying to communicate with man with mankind and if we ask ourselves has that is that the thing that's happened after the coming of the lord jesus christ and the answer which we see here is of course not god has been speaking to man ever since ever fr since the beginning of the creation so from the creation of adam God was talking to him face to face and that was before the fall. So one will ask, has this kind of communication stopped or changed after the fall? The answer is no. <clears throat> and the first example happens when immediately after the fall and we all know the story that Adam and Eve hid themselves from God so God went out searching for them and his voice came out seeking them and saying Adam Adam where are you then God continued to speak to man he spoke and we have many examples in the Old Testament he spoke to Cain despite the uh, his gross sin that he committed by killing his brother he spoke after that through all his people including noah and uh, thereafter as we know he used to speak a lot in different ways and different forms to abraham to uh, isaac to jacob who became israel later on and for many many times he spoke to moses as we know uh, he spoke to the prophets so when we read the prophets in the Old Testament we can always find that sentence at the beginning says the word of God through Jeremiah the word of God through Isaiah and so on so God has never stopped talking to man has always been talking to uh, man ever since man was created 
And that makes us stop for a second and think, do we really appreciate that fact that God is speaking to man? God is speaking to us. He wants to communicate with you. He wants to communicate with me. He's always uh, reaching out to uh, talk, to communicate, to build up that broken relationship. But when he says he has been speaking in different ways or different means or ver various times and, and various ways, it actually attracts your attention to the ways that God used to speak to his prophets and his people in the past through dreams, visions, voices, through his angels, sometimes apparitions and so on and so forth. And we have plenty of examples in the Old Testament. But we come here to the most wonderful thing that happened to humanity, which is the conclusion of, or the, my, we might say, the climax of this communication between God and mankind, when he says, in the last days spoken to us by his son. That straight away reminded me of chapter 4 of the epistle to the Galatians when it says in verse 4 so chapter 4 and verse 4 it says but when the fullness of the time had come God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons so the ultimate goal of these previous ways and means of communication in the past came and magnified itself and by, by God speaking directly in his son to us. So in fact he revealed himself more clearly to mankind through incarnation and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, that's why I wanted to talk about this one and a half verse before we go into the following uh, few verse because it's very important for us to understand and appreciate the grace and the blessing that we live in that now we have seen, we have heard, we have uh, in fact live very intimately with God himself through the abiding in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Following that, he will start to describe the son, or in other words, to describe the glory of the son, and will give us here seven full descriptions of that glory. And I will say them to you one by one, so you can mark them or number them in your book as we go along. First, when he says, appointed heir of all things, that is the son. He gave him everything. All creation has been made by him, but also given to him to have authority over. And the second point, when he says, by whom he made the worlds. So he made the world, or God made the world, or created the world by the son, and also gave the Son all the authority, all the power over his creation. Number three, when he says the brightness of his glory, the brightness of his glory, which is a very uh, interesting point and very interesting and very important description of the nature of God, of his self being apparent and very clear now, uh, we came to know the nature of God, how he is, what are his characters, what is his works, very clearly when we've seen his son. Then comes number four, the ex expression of his substance. And that is more to do with the personality of God. 
And then comes number five when he says, upholding all things by the word of his power. What does that mean? Because before that he says uh, in number two, by whom he made the word, uh, the words. So yes, he made the words, he created the world, but it's not like uh, uh, somebody who manufactured, say, a car or something, and let, let go, sold it out, and knows nothing about it. No. God here created the world by the Son, but also the Son, He is the one who is keeping all this world, all, all the universe, if we may say, under control. So everything in this creation is under His power and is under His control. He is the great, great maestro. And then comes number six, which is having made by himself the purification of sins. It's uh, very important to understand that for God to prepare and uh, put forward that plan of salvation and give us that purification of sin to restore us to our initial or original glory is a part of his own glory. To do that for us, it's a great expression of his love, which is in the core nature of uh, God. And then comes number seven, which is the last one, when he says, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And the expression here is very interesting because we need to give it a little bit of attention and understand it more when we read it, generally speaking, in the Bible, when he says, sat down. And sitting here is not in the... Uh, in the uh, act of sitting or uh, as opposed to standing, but it is more and more an expression of establishment. So it, it, God is establishing his authority. His authority has always been established, but that has been reinforced even further after his act of redemption. And also when we say sit down or sat down to to uh, differentiate between him and the angels and that will become apparent later on in the same chapter when he will start to compare the son with the angels. So that would bring me to the end of uh, verse 4 and the end of this particular paragraph because the rest of the chapter will shift and start to compare, and as we said at the beginning, contrast or comparison is more or less the theme of this epistle, and the reason for that, that St. Paul here is trying to compare, to convince them, persuade them that don't worry, this person that you are believing in, you should have strong faith in, because he is the person of God, he is the son of God, he is nowhere to compare with the angels or Moses or uh, Joshua or any of these figures that you have ever believed in before. So when we read further in this chapter, we will start that path of comparison. And the rest of the first chapter is interested in comparing or putting the contrast between the sun and the angels. So let us read together from verse 5. This next section begins probably from verse 4 when it says, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And the word better or more excellent, you will notice when we study this epistle, is being repeated in the whole epistle 13 times. And that goes along with what we have said earlier, that the theme of the epistle is a theme of contrast. And then after he says that, or mentioned this statement, saying that the son has obtained a more excellent name, or more excellent position, or is by far more excellent nature than the angels, he will start giving 
seven quotations from the Old Testament and this is important because, because all the epistle is based on the Old Testament and as we said in the introduction this epistle, epistle to the Hebrews is one of the strongest or the best links between the New Testament and the Old Testament and the reason that he is giving quotations from the Old Testament is that he is talking to Christians from Jewish background who know the book of Moses very well who know the book of the prophets they know their books very well or the scripture very well so and they believe in the scripture very well. So if I give you evidence or quotations from the Old Testament, you are more likely to believe what I say. And that's the stream of thoughts that St. Paul, Paul had when he was writing this epistle. And what we will try to do is we will read each quotation and read alongside with it the exact text of the quotation as it is written in the Old Testament. So the first one, and we said it's seven, so okay, the first one, when it says, for to which the, of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, to die, today I have begotten you. Again, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So. What is he referring to in this one? He is referring to Psalm 2 and verse 7, where it says, I will declare the decree. I will declare, declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And here is the spirit of prophecy. Although it is David who is writing the psalm, but now, who is talking on the tongues of David or through David is the son himself and saying, You, the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As if the son is talking to the father and saying, You, uh, he, the Lord or the God the father has said to me, the son, You are my son, today I have begotten you. This particular prophecy or quote as has been given has been declared publicly at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you remember or if you, we go back together to uh, chapter 2 of St. Luke's uh, Gospel and verse 10 to 11, it says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, he's talking to the shepherds, of course, you know that. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For into you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So this is the first quotation that gives evidence and proof that what has happened at the fullness of time, at the time of birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was declared publicly by the angels to the shepherd, is exactly to fulfill the prophecy, the prophecy that was given in Psalm 2 and verse 7 as we read it together. So that's number one. Move on and go into number two, or quotation number two, when it says here, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Where that was said in the Old Testament. Okay, let's open together the book of Samuel, the second book of Samuel. And chapter 7, verse 14. We'll uh, read together here, but in order to understand the occasion when that was said, let us read from verse 12. Uh, it says, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, and here God is talking to David, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
Then comes, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. So the quote is coming from verse 14. When it says here, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Here, where the spirit of prophecy is talking to David about his ultimate offspring, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come at the fullness of time and he will become the father, the, the son of the father and the father will become his, uh, and God the father become his father. Then we move into quotation number three, and that is read in verse six, when it says, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all angels of God worship him. Here he is quoting a verse from Psalm 97 and verse seven. But what stopped me here, the word, firstborn and the, of course he is talking about the son the lord jesus jesus christ when he talks about the son as the firstborn it does not mean that he began at a certain time or he did not exist beforehand of course not god or god the son the lord is existent from before the beginning and to up to no end so eternal what so what does does it mean when he says firstborn firstborn here means he is the beginning or the founder of the new creation and theologically this has got a very wonderful meaning because he is the founder of the new mankind of the new the, the new creation that are bound to inherit heavenly kingdom because after the fall as we all know we've lost that position and our nature became corrupt and we needed to be recreated not to be repaired they were the damage was beyond repair as i would normally say but we needed to be created again or born again and we all know that so that first born is indicating to the new creation on the new nature that we have acquired through uh, him then he comes to quotation number four and he says of the angels and always bear in mind that he is comparing the lord with the angels so he says here of the angels he says he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire and he gets that quotation from Psalm 104 and verse uh, 4. We get that together and we'll read it in a minute. Okay, I got the verse here in front of me from Psalm 104 verse 4. It says, Who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire? And here it indicates that the angels are creatures and no matter how awesome their power is, they worship this who is no doubt greater than them. Next one, which is the fifth quotation, as it reads from verse 8 and 9, it says, But to the Son he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. He refers here to Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7. And if you read that part of the psalm, it says more or less the exact words. In fact, we use this part of the psalm in the um, Good Friday. And towards the end of the day, we have this long hymn that takes about 20 minutes, only 
uh, praising God with the words of this part of the psalm. Here when he talks about the Son of God as the King, he talks about the scepter of righteousness. Or a scepter is like a decorated rod, which is a symbol that the kings used to use as a symbol of authority or ruling. And now he is saying that the way of your ruling is through ultimate righteousness. And that in, in this way, he is nowhere to compare with any other king, as there is no king on earth from beginning to end has ever ruled with ultimate righteousness apart from our king and Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we know or we knew that there are um, some of the kings in the past were relatively righteous, but none of them is an absolute or a, an ultimate or ruled with the ultimate righteousness as he describes our Lord in this part. Also, we notice the word anointed. When he says here, God, your God has anointed you. And uh, God the Father has anointed the Son, and the word anointment is used to, in the past, or in the Old Testament, when we uh, talk about anointing uh, kings, prophets, and high priest. These were the three categories that used to be anointed by oil. And the Lord here was anointed by the Holy Spirit and this took place when he was baptized by John the Baptism. And we all know what happened in this particular occasion. And the reference for it, I remind you, is written in three of the four Gospels. It is written in... Chapter 3 of St. Matthew and chapter 3 of St. Luke and chapter 1 of St. Mark's Gospel. And we all know when he was baptized and came out of water, the voice from heaven came and said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. And that is the time of anointment. And the anointment here happened directly by the Holy Spirit. To which, what used to happen in the past when uh, kings, prophets, or priests were anointed by the oil, were just a symbol of the anointment by the Holy Spirit. Here is a clear indication that the Lord has taken his position as the king of kings, as the high priest, and also as a prophet because he expresses God to us. So he, uh, not as a prophecy, but in, as mentioned at the very beginning of the chapter, God has spoken to us by his son. So we can consider him as a prophet. But also he says here that he was anointed more than your companions. And that is a, a tone or a sound of humbleness of the Lord himself as comparing himself with other kings, prophets, and priests. Although by no far, as we know, uh, there is any element of comparison or equal footing between the two. The Lord is the Lord of Lords. Also, before we leave this point, there's something that attracted my attention, which is that when the Lord was anointed, that happened at the beginning of his mission, and he did not sit on his throne or fulfilled that mission until three years or more later on, when that happened on, on the cross. And that again takes us back to the point which was mentioned in, uh, verse, in verse 3, when he says here, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This reminds me of what happened to David uh, himself, because David was anointed by Samuel as king of Israel and never took over his throne until later on, which I think about seven years when Saul was, was killed and uh, David became the, the king. After that comes the sixth quotation, which is read from verse 10 to 12, and he says, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. Exact the same words are quoted from Psalm 102, verse 25 to verse 27. And in here, it signifies two main things. Firstly, that he is the creator, and secondly, that he has no beginning or end. And that last point is re-emphasized in chapter 13, or the last chapter of this epistle, when he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then in verse 13, it gives us the seventh and the last quotation in this chapter, as a comparison to the angels when he says, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This quotation is taken from Psalm 110 and verse 1. And it shows that this position cannot be given to any creature irrespective to his superiority. On the contrary, when he puts on the contrary, when he puts the contrast with the angels, he is making it clear that they are servants. And if you read the last verse of this chapter, it gives us a very important point that these angels are not servants or ministers, ministers only for the Lord himself, but for those who will inherit salvation. And that is very clear when we read verse 14, and it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will in inherit salvation? And we'll stop here and think, who are those who will inherit salvation? And the question is very clear to you and me, is that it is us who are inheriting salvation. That means that the angels, no matter how high in the hierarchy they are, are still servants to the Lord and servants to us in Him. So how amazing and how wonderful when we think that we are being served by angels. We are being served by angels. But to enjoy this wonderful privilege, we've got to stay all, at all times abiding in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So in conclusion in this chapter, we noticed maybe we put it in three main points. The first point that God speaks to man. And he's always done that, speaking to man before the fall and after the fall. And this kind of communication 
have reached its climax or its utmost when he declares himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ through incarnation. That's point number one. Point number two is when he speaks in the following three verse about the sevenfold description of his glory. And then after that, as if he's opening a bracket uh, to compare or to put a contrast between the, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and <clears throat> the angels. And he quotes here seven quotations from the Old Testament to stress or re-emphasize or reinforce the point that the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is by far higher or superior than the angels, or in other words, he is the creator of the angels, and the angels, no matter their superiority or their level of hierarchy, they are still servants or ministering spirits to him and to us in him. Here we have come to the end of this chapter and I hope this quick view of that chapter makes it easy for you when you read through and understand more and more all the difficult bits within. Uh, so before I leave you to that, I hope that we will meet the next episode to study the second chapter and from now until then glory be to God forever and ever amen and God bless you all